Welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. I hope you've got your cup of coffee, tea, or juice ready because it's getting steamier, it's getting hotter. We're going to the, of the press where we look at some hot you know, headlines. And we have an analyst joining us right now, and we know how how exciting it can get when our analysts join us to take a look at these headlines. Jida Johnson, Chief Lecturer, Nigerian Institute of Journalism, Lagos State, is here with me. Good morning to you, Chief Jida Johnson. Good morning, Aurea Ines. It's a pleasure to have you back. <laughs> and uh, good morning to our viewers all over the world. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here always. So let's start with the Punch newspaper. The Punch is leading with, Labor falls 180 billion Naira palliatives says governors will frustrate program. Well, the riders there, states get 180 trucks of rice. NLC, TUC, worry politicians will hoard materials. Neck committee to meet labor after subsidy relief. Tinubu appeals to Nigerians. Let's begin with that. Nigerians have been calling for these palliatives. Well, here they are. Or are they not? The, it's just the level of inconsistency and government not coming out clean with us. If you are removing the subsidy on one hand and then you are spending money on palliative, how do you reconcile that? Mm. As far as I'm concerned, if government is spending 180 billion for, for just short term intervention, why don't you spend that 180 billion on long term intervention? So the problem probably so final is to work quality of our production capacity and also increasing the capacity for us to export to other countries other than exporting the crude in its crude form and then importing the refined products so as far as i'm concerned it's just a drop in the ocean um who is going to hold it this one are 80 billion uh, five five billion to each of the states uh, regardless of the population it was based on base of equality how do you compare Lagos with Baeza or, or Rivers with Kano State, for example? So as far as I'm concerned, with respect to the removal of subsidy, I didn't think that this administration actually knew what they wanted to do. It was, it was an impulsive decision. And when you take decision on impulse, there is tendency for you to have this type of uh, flip-flop, uh, policy flip-flop that this administration is having. Now, you could see that initially, um, they have always been caused by various interest groups. Now it's Labour that is saying that they are not in support of the palliative because the governors would turn this to a political, 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 political game just to satisfy um, their own political supporters. In whereas the money belongs to every Nigerian, regardless of whether you vote or you never voted, regardless of whether you voted for the party at the center or at the state level. Or you never voted for that party. You are a Nigerian. You are a taxpayer. You are entitled to every privilege that every citizenry surely enjoys. So I don't know. I just I just think that um, the the best way moving forward might sometimes be going backward. I think it's not too late for the administration to restrain itself and go back to the subsidy regime and then work out a plan. Let's say a two-year plan or a three-year plan in which we make our refinery to be functional and then gradually you remove the subsidy and you allow the local production to 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 meet up with the demands. You mean like it's we, we saw playing out then probably it, demand. You mean like we saw playing out in Kenya? Yeah, we, yeah just just like it played out. You, you just you can't you can't just come the, the ripple effect of that pronouncement by the president during his inaugural speech, inaugural speech. He has, we have not recovered from it. The entire economy has not recovered from it. Um, I think in the course of this week, it was revealed that the inflation rate is about 24.9%. 24 That's close to about 25%. If mm -hmm. you are looking at the inflation rate, because mm -hmm. Nigeria is a monoproduct economy, and if you have a monoproduct economy, the entire economy takes its cost from the prices of oil, uh, crude oil, petroleum product, and it affects every business. So, for me, if I'm to advise the president, it's not too late for him to go back. And then they work out a well-detailed plan, not an impulsive plan. 
Um, this one that right, is where is it coming from? Is it appropriated? Is it an is it a supplementary budget? The question people have where is this one eighty billion coming from? Where is well, it coming the from? government has made it clear that there's no going back on subsidy. And you know, as I alluded to what happened in Kenya, they removed subsidy, the people cried out against it seriously, and they brought it back, albeit temporarily so that they can fashion out the best way to go around it. And that's what you're suggesting that the Nigerian government should do. However, yeah, we, we had them say this week clearly because there were speculations. There were speculations as to whether the government is going back to subsidy. But they came out to say, no, they are not going back. There's, there's no going back on that. And you know, so they um, borrowed, you know, the, the money they borrowed now, the NNPC has borrowed with regards to to solving this problem. You know, well, um, you recall that two days ago, the special advisor to the president of media and publicity came and said, I use the word, determine to ensure that the prices does not, does not go up and uh, fluctuate. That in itself is what? That itself is government intervention. We have government intervention because how are they going to do it? If you say that, okay, you ensure that the price of petroleum PMS does not go beyond 560, does not go beyond 600, 600 naira. What are you going to do when you have left everything to market forces? As far as I'm concerned, I think that the economic blueprint for, for the administration has not been well thought out. It's not been well planned. Uh, the president just assigned portfolio to his ministers. I think there is a need for him to have a serious meeting with his economic team and for them to review this issue before, before implementing whatever policy they want to implement. You see, this issue of this palliative may not be like that of the COVID palliative. Hmm. COVID palliative that was taught. That is that one of the major fears Nigerians are having. Yeah. The governors that, that, have not shown themselves to be trustworthy at all. Uh, Even the local government palli chairman. Yeah, the palliatives that were stored in, in private warehouses, palliatives that were used by members of State House of Assembly and House of Rep as their own empowerment program, palliatives that were used by as of rep members and as of assembly members to celebrate their birthdays. So as far as Nigerians are concerned, the, 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 the credibility, Nigerians don't have trust in the political class and the people who have elected into public office because they've trusted them and over time and over and over again, they've been disappointed. They've been they've dis disappointed by, by quote unquote, the insensitivity of people who are given the responsibility of managing state affairs. So. When, when you look at this palliative, it's just like a drop in the ocean. If you are spending 180 billion, why can't you invest that 180 billion in the oil and gas sector? Invest the money in the oil and gas sector. How much will it cost to build the modular refinery? But let's produce locally. And let's produce Johnson, locally. Yeah, Jide Johnson, yeah. shouldn't we, first of all, be asking questions about does before investing any further funds in that sector and building any refinery what happened to all the billions that have been put in there in the last eight years with regards to uh the refineries turn around maintenance the, apart from turnaround maintenance the service the, the, we were told that we, by december the refinery some of them should be working where are all the monies who are those who were paid yeah, that's, that's with the argument of some, which I share, the, the sentiment with them, with respect to the, the challenge we have in the oil and gas sector is not the problem of an average Nigeria. It's a problem of some select few that are making this nation dry, that are making money, that are making fortunes out of the pains of millions of Nigeria. Who are these people? They are not faceless. These non-state actors can be identified. And if these non-state actors can be identified, why can't the government go after them? And inflict pain on them and not on average on average Nigerian. But what do we, what do we know? You have a situation we are taught that the way the president dealt decisively with the issue of central bank, even though the approach of arresting the suspending, the process of suspending and arranging the central bank governor, I do not I do not I do not approve of that in a democratic dispensation. If you have an allegation against somebody, you bring it before the court, let the court at this side, and you allow the normal police to deal with the matter. The way that the EFCC matter was also dealt with, removal of the chairman, I do not approve the approach that has also been taken because it's not been arranged. We are thought that that would also be the approach that will be used for NNPC. 
that, that would be the approach that we use for NNPC. An they aviation. Say, but the same, you, you can't change the system. You can't, you can't clean the stable without bringing out all, 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 all the horses in the stable. Now, you can't have the same management that ran the subsidy regime, that ran NNPC under the stop and the same regime in, in, in place. So we are thought that well, the president will have removed the chairman of uh, CEO of NNPC and the management board, and the management board will have been replaced by a new team so that the new team can come in and come clean with Nigeria. We don't even know. You recall the privatization. Nobody knows anything with respect to the privatization of NNPC as publicized and celebrated by the last regime and the present management team. So the more you look, the less you see. Well, let, let's go further. It's still on the front page of the Punch newspaper. You have Amir Fele, since you've already mentioned him. Amir Fele, DSS drops firearms charges. 6.9 billion Naira fraud case adjourned. See, you, you've well, already um, said you don't like the way it's been handled. Yeah. Well, um, if you if you look at um, the way they went about the gun gun charges, the drama that surrounded it, and then um, the fight between agencies of government over who takes custody of of a mafili in Lagos, you 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 you'll be irritated with the outcome. At the end of the day, the government is dropping its charges. However, the, the, the charges that were leveled against him has to do with procurement. And I think that if it has to do with procurement, I think procurement of, um, I think, land cruisers and the rest of it, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous if you are prosecuting the central bank governor for procurement of. What, what, what about others? If there's a management team, there are others that are involved. Get every one of them. If the present acting uh, central bank um, governor was part of the management team. Mm. All the management team should, should face the music because it must have been discussed at, at the management meeting. Whatever policy Emifili embarked upon, you shouldn't forget the fact that Emifili did not act in isolation. He was reporting to the president and he also has a management team. What we've done is to remove only Emifili from central bank. What about all other actors and players in the central bank that acted with him? Are you getting my point? It's, mm -hmm. it's a classic case in my local dialect, which is that you leave you you leave the wound. You are dealing with you are dealing with a small saw. So that's that that's that's just my take concerning that. I think that uh, a mafia issue is a test case for a democratic experience. And I've said it: if you are occupying the public office today and you are seeing the way mafia is being treated by a new administration, the rest are short. That if there's a new sheriff in town, it might likely be your turn. That's why every one of us must condemn any autocratic tendency by those who have elected into public office. There are processes and procedures through which issues of this manner can be dealt with, not um, trying to, 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 to use state institution to stifle um, perceived, perceived, quote unquote, perceived um, political um, opponent or uh, perceived. People that do not work in the interest of 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 that do not work in the in, in your interest during an electionary campaign. I don't know any feeling from anywhere, but the truth must the truth must be told. The approach the government has adopted, Emifili did not act in isolation. It was a central bank governor. Definitely, it was a central bank governor responsible to a president. Responsible, you had is in charge of the uh, of the monetary policy. What about those that are in charge of the fiscal policy? You had the ministers. You had Attorney generals are not of those that were involved in the kitchen cabinet, just like the present CBN, acting CBN governor is in the kitchen cabinet of the present president. So if you are holding a mifili liable, you should hold everybody liable. That's, it also that's calls... my take. And then you should, allow the, you should allow the judicial process to be transparent, to be open. And exactly. Not be the judicial process. And I think it also brings to mind the fact that anyone who is given public office should respect the rule of law. Emir Fele himself is guilty of that. You know, during his yeah, time no, under the last administration, he also no, flouted No some... doubt about that. No doubt about that. But we can't we can perpetuate that lack of respect for the rule of law. No doubt about that. There's no doubt that people that have been elected in public office in the past have utter lack of respect for, for, for the rule of law, for even institutions that have oversight functionary. I recall when the National Assembly invited him, 
he, he, he ignored, he ignored, he ignored, he ignored their invitation. And uh, you saw, it almost cost the Minister of Aviation designate, um, what was his name, Festus Kayamo, because he would not have been screened by the National mm -hmm. Assembly, the National Assembly as early as, um, I, I don't think Festus Kayamo will have, will have been screened as a minister, not to talk of being designated as the Minister of Aviation. As far as those that are occupying office today, it should be a test case for them. For them to understand that for us to build this democracy, we must respect the institution, the various institution of democracy. Yeah. That's how you strengthen democracy. Democracy is not the personalization of governance. Now, what we have seen is that we have seen the personalization of the institution of, gov of government, whereby people occupying some agencies of government, critical agencies of government, their loyalty is to, is to, is to the chief executive of whether the ministry, the department or agency, or the chief executive of, 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 the, of, the, of the presidency. And it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Okay, it shouldn't let's, so. let's move on to the next newspaper, Daily Independent. Well, Daily Independent was well, still leads with the FG states, you know, FG gives states 5 billion naira each as palliative over subsidy removal. But let's drop that since we've already looked at it from the Punch newspaper and go to Above the Masthead where you have three officers. 22 soldiers killed in Niger ambush, says Defense Headquarters. Well, I, 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 yesterday, I was, yesterday I was following the news and I listened to the spokesperson of Defense Headquarters providing information and then asking Nigeria not to join in the debate over propaganda. Now imagine the territorial integrity of Nigeria within, not outside Nigeria, and within a state in Nigeria, we lost that amount of military personnel. Look at the amount of money we have used to train them. Look at um, the families of this disease. Mm -hmm. And we have not been able to come out with a clear cut um, reason behind, behind this nefarious attack. As far as I'm concerned, that's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. I think this is a terrorist attack. I don't think um, uh, there's no way there's no way um, this could have been caused by bandit. Even if it's caused by banditry or what have you, the, the best way to describe this set of people that have committed this crime against the state, crime against humanity, is to, is to tag them as terrorists. Mm -hmm. Is to tag them. They, 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 there's, there's, there's no excuse for bad, for bad behavior. There's no excuse for criminality. As far as I'm concerned, if Nigerian soldiers could be killed in that manner, with the level of sophistication of the equipment they have, how many citizens or residents of the area where that attack happened have been killed silently that we didn't even get to know about it? That we didn't get to know about it. It's 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 that it's, it's enough for a country to declare war. If this had happened, let, let's put it in perspective. Let's say this had happened to Nigerian soldiers in Togo. What do you think will have happened? What would you think would be the sentiment of the public? I'm just saying hypothetically that Nigerian soldiers were attacked in Togo on the public of Benin mm -hmm. or in Niger, and then we lost that amount of soldiers. And what do you think would be the action? And then when, when, when such tragedy when such tragedy happens, we just take it as business as usual, as if something is something. There was no the flag was not flown half mast. The flag was not flown half mast. We just went about it as if, okay, is the business as 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 Have as we become issue. too used as a people? Have we, begun, have, have we become too used to losing our people, losing lives in this country where you, you hear in Plateau State, hundreds have been killed, mass burial, you hear in Benue State, that have done, Berno State. Have we become so insensitive now to the value that a human life that, should have? Well... If you travel through the length and breadth of Nigeria, I've had cause to travel through the length and breadth. I was in I was in Kaduna, I was in Kano, uh, I, I was in Nikitil just last week. I was in Enugu three, four weeks ago, and I had cause to go through the roads in most of these places where my flight were cancelled. And I, you ask, the question you ask is, what's the value of and of 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 of, of in Nigeria? What's the value of my life? What value does government place in my life? I just came back from the airport to, bring, to pick a friend who returned from England, and then he's been in England. The last time he was in Nigeria, it was in 2016. And he said, it seems as if things have gotten worse. I just dropped him in his hotel in Iketa. 
for doing this program. So you, the question you ask, what value do we place on the Nigerian life? It's, I, 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 our leaders are so insensitive to the plight of men. I told you, like when, if that should happen in the United States, the flag will be flown half-mast. That you lose that amount of And every because... single person involved in that killing would be caught. Exactly. We, did you see? You, you can't just kill a Nigerian soldier and whatever, whatever affects a Nigerian soldier. Because the mandate of the of the Nigerian of the Nigerian military is to protect and defend the territorial integrity. And if within the territorial integrity of your nation, that's a, what type of signal are we saying that our defense? formations are incapable of defending us. That could be the interpretation that some could subject it to. Okay, let's move from that to uh, what's unfolding regarding Niger. We're ready for Niger with our standby force. That's ECOWAS. Page 7 is where the details of that is on uh, the Daily Independent. ECOWAS is just playing to the gallery as far as I'm concerned. With respect to dealing with the Niger issue, mm. the Niger issue has come. What we should try to do is to prevent such from happening in other African countries, particularly West African countries, and for those issues to be seriously addressed. The internal issue before this internal, before this um, internal issues turn to crisis, that's where ECOWAS should intervene so as to forestall future um, coup. Deter across Africa. Well, that's, AU, that's, AU that's, is opposing the, uh, the, the ECOWAS. AU on Daily Trust it says, AU opposes military action as ECOWAS readies forces. So there's a conflict here well, between AU well, and it's an ECOWAS. It's an, internal, it's, an internal problem of, it's an internal problem of Niji. I think what ECOWAS should do is to engage, is to engage with, with, the, with the coup. The coup, he, the coup has lasted more than, more than three weeks. So what they should do is to engage with the, with, with, with the with the present military heads of Niger and look at the timetable for return to, to civilian administration, return to democratic process. What's the timetable? I think that's the approach that ECOWAS should be looking at because ECOWAS will be playing the ostrich. Who are those that they are in ECOWAS? You are talking about Alassane Ouattara, who changed the constitution, who changed the constitution in Coup d'Ivoire to ensure that they got a third term when the constitution made the provisions for just two terms. That's a coup in itself. Or you, are, you see the, the leaders of Burkina Faso, where you are, where it's being led by a military person, or in Chad, or in Mali, or in Guinea. Uh, or, or, so uh, uh, even ECOWAS, would they be able to? So who is going to, who is going to fund this war? My question is going to fund it. If Nigeria is complaining that we don't have money, we don't have money to subsidize Nigerians, but we have resources to go and fight war. Well, different countries have indicated interest. Ivory Coast uh, said they'll be bringing out between 800 to 1,000 uh, people to join the force. Okay. Well, uh, I wish Alassane Ouattara good luck. <laughs> Let him come with 1,000. 1, the burden will be on Nigeria. If you recall what happened in Liberia, when uh, under the Bangladesh administration, when we intervened in Liberian crisis, mm. uh, we knew how many people lost their loved ones from. We knew some that have not even gotten the benefits that are entitled to their to their loved ones of fighting in the uh, in the echo as being part and parcel of the Ecomog forces. And we knew the history of some people that they became billionaires by virtue of um, by virtue of the supplies of they weapons. engaged in during the Ecomog. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, even beyond weapons, supplies of uniform, supplies of food, and the rest of it. So when you see war, quote unquote, when you see war, when you are seeing the drum beat of war, you see when that drum is becoming higher. Don't forget that there are people that make money. That the military-industrial complex, they make money from selling arms. If there are no wars, how would they sell their arms? Mm -hmm. So whoever is encouraging ECOWAS to go to war, they are looking for an opportunity. To, to sell their arms, and they are looking for an opportunity either to turn Africa to another Syria or to turn the West African coast to another Syria or to turn the West African coast to what happened in Libya. Libya has not recovered from what the West did in Libya or what they turned Iraq to. Iraq has not recovered from, from the invasion based, based on pure lies on weapons of mass destruction. You know, so, I saw a special I, report on CNN last night uh, on four. It was horrible. Yeah. 
the pictures, yeah, the gory even, pictures. Yeah, if, Humans, if, even you could just not, see dead they, bodies on the streets of Darfur. Yeah, they've not looked. They've not looked at the Sudan issue. Even the, the Sudan issue has not been looked at. You did not talk about it, and the ECOWAS did not talk about it, and then you are now much more concerned. What's the interest of ECOWAS in Niger? And who are those? They didn't show that interest when there was a coup in Guinea. They didn't show that interest when there was a coup in Burkina Faso. They didn't show that interest when there was a coup in Mali. Why Guinea? All right. Uh, let's move forward from there and uh, see how... Um, let's talk about something that concerns your colleague in one of the universities, Unical. Unical suspends yeah, dean accused of sexually harassing students. We keep hearing these cases that, yes. over and over and over. Why won't lecturers think, learn and leave girls alone? I think that the internal mechanism of the school should have dealt with this matter before it gets out of hand. And I'm sure there must have been series of petitions that must have been written, and they must have turned a blind eye to 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 to, to this to this issue before it gets it gets it gets out of out of out of hand. As far as I'm concerned. The university system must put a system in place that gives students the opportunity to express themselves. And what are these opportunities? You have the student union, you have the departmental association and the rest of it. But you know what? What we have succeeded in doing across campuses all over Nigeria is to stifle some form of representation for the student, or rather to impose our puppets to be in leadership of these, um, these uh, associations and unions across, across board. I jokingly told my student, I said, I can never imagine that while we were in school and um, first subsidy would just be removed like that and then there will be no protest from students. From students. I recall how, how, how we sent Babangida away from Lagos in 1990, 1991 through removal of first subsidy. I recall how many vehicles we seized on third mainland bridge um, federal government vehicle that, was, that, 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 that were taken to Unilag, Unilag campuses. And then over time, university vice chancellors, rectors, and heads of institutions have destroyed a critical component of student leadership by not aligned, by prescribing student unionism. Because if this union are in place in the school, some of these issues that have been addressed before, before it became a public. It's it's one. For example, it's not just that lecturer that's affected. The VC, the institution overall. Yeah. Anytime you see somebody from that, even the entire faculty, and probably when those allegations were leveled against against this prof, uh, they used their um, their cult of friends to cover up for it, and it has gotten it has gotten out of it has gotten out of. And I, I don't think there is a coming back for this particular for this particular professor. Oh, he has been barred this. from entering that school until he's summoned, especially he's invited, summoned. And he's mm. invited by the panel and the rest, and the rest, and the rest, and the rest of you to address to address those issues. There's no smoke without fire. Once that issue came up, I think that issue will have been addressed internally before it degenerated to this to this um, public major crisis for the institution. Yeah. Well, I saw something here, which I, I wonder if you would want to talk about. Um, that's on the Daily Independent. Lai Mohammed offers services of his PR firm to Tunubu's government. Have you seen that? Well, um, why is he offering the services? He's looking for a <laughs> consultancy job. These people, these people have no cap. They have no cap in the sense that why is he offering his services for free? Uh, he's a Trojan horse. Don't accept. You know the, you know the, you know the story behind the Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. Well, when you offer it for free, invariably they start paying for it later. Why is he offering that services? That he, why didn't he offer it for free when he was serving as Minister of Information and Culture for eight years under Barry's administration? Mm -hmm. He had to navigate the the poor image of that particular administration. Why is he offering it for free for now? We don't need anything from Lai. Uh, he's done his bid. He should just go and rest. He's done. He's been a minister for eight years. Uh, that's 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 more than enough for him mm -hmm. to go to go and rest and not offer 
the services of his um, PR agency. When did he establish the PR agency? Was he established while he was in government? Did he use his own office while he was in government to enrich himself privately by giving jobs, consultancy job to this his PR 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 agency? And then when did he qualify to practice public relations in Nigeria? Was he certified? Well, in any case, all of these professional bodies, the moment they appoint ministers, they make them fellows. Uh, so you, you can be you might be shocked honor, that is a honor, fellow of <laughs> fellow. Uh, you might be a fellow of NIPR and a fellow of ACON. In any case, we never knew him having an agency, having a PR agency. We all, all we knew him to be was the ACN spokesperson, from ACN spokesperson to APC spokesperson, from APC spokesperson to Minister of Information and Culture for eight years. So I, I think President Inubu should not accept, should not accept this offer. He's just looking for a way to get himself involved, to partake of the cookie jar. That's what he's trying to do. Oh, well, from Lai Mohammed, we now let's go to what Jega is up to. Uh, Jega to lead Carter Center election observation mission to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <clears throat> Where you have the crocodile, quote unquote. <laughs> the nickname of the president is the crocodile. Mm. Um, <laughs> Jega to lead them. Um, well, do, do they have elections in Zimbabwe? Or are they going to have a coronation in Zimbabwe with respect to after uh, uh, I want to recall the name of the president now. I can't recall his name now. After he took over from Mugabe, he himself has further entrenched himself as 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 the dictator. In, in, in Zimbabwe. So what are they going to observe? The election that was observed in Nigeria by the EU and by the EU, when they wrote the report, what did we do? The federal government came out to condemn the report and said that um, it's an internal affair. They did. The, the body that conducted the election did very well and the, as far as they are concerned, the election is transparent and what have you. When you see all of these observations and the rest of it, I just see it as one way or the other of giving credibility to the to the um, electoral electoral body electoral body in, in in Zimbabwe, and there seems to be um, a new type of relationship among heads of electoral bodies across the length and breadth of Africa. Just like you have the committee of head of states, you have the committee of vice councillors, you also have the committees of um, electoral electoral umpires and. Across across Africa, and once they are through with their tenure, they graduate into into an observer. So you can imagine somebody like um, the president and next chairman. Once he's through with his tenure, Mahmoud, he too will become an observer. If the election he conducted in Nigeria, he couldn't even comply with the lay down procedure guidelines and what have you. And then he will go to another country to be supervising that their own election. It's just. We are, just, we are just playing the ostrich. That's what I just know. Okay. Well, still with the Daily Trust, you have bribery allegation hit stop Kano election petitions tribunal. What's going well, on then, in that? I, I, I saw that the, the chairperson, the lady that said that um, there were attempts for her to be bribed and then nobody should come to her to be bribed. Um, you see, justice delay is justice denied. And some of us have advocated that for us to really put in place a proper democratic structure. The dispensation of justice with respect to electoral matters should have been completed and concluded before swearing in. I don't see why electoral matters should take more than time. Yeah, I think Go ahead. We're having problems with your audio, so um, but it's good that it's clear now. Please go ahead. If you do accelerated hearing, so now why the election petition matter shouldn't be dealt with in under 30 days. You do accelerated hearing. You sit every day. That's why you constitute the panel. That's the issue they will dispense with. Within 30 days, you dispense and you come up with your judgment before the swearing. -in. Whoever is declared the winner is declared the winner. Election that you want them to run will be run. So, for example, if the judiciary in his wisdom, nullifies, let me say, you have 36 state gubernatorial election and 18 were nullified, quote unquote, due to non-compliance 
what do, what does that say about the electoral body? Whoever is taking over from the head of the electoral body, after that, we want to ensure that during my tenure, elections are not outrightly cancelled throughout the length of of, of of But there is no consequence for for bad behavior. If you delay, justice delay is justice denied. When you wait too long to adjudicate on the matter, you are making rooms for people to maneuver the system, to manipulate the system. It's Look, I'll give you this classic example. When mm. Jesus was arrested, there were attempts by people to bribe Pontius Pilate, who happens to be the judge. There mm. were attempts. They offered him a bribe. That's even in the Bible. So, not to talk of what we are witnessing to, so they offered him a bribe. So not to talk of not to talk of not to talk of today. If we really want to put this democracy in its proper shape, we should dispense electoral matters. So it's good not to see it's good election. to see a judicial officer, you know, standing tall and saying no to corruption, isn't it? Especially today, where we have uh, so much uh, lack of trust. Uh, you know, uh, Nigerians yeah, seem to have trust you, in the judiciary. If, you do, if you, do, you do the credibility index, if you do the credibility index of the Nigerian judiciary, public perception of it, if you do it among among Nigerians, I'm not sure that the judiciary will get up to 35% approval rating. Do we know I'm when the sure. PET, uh, that's the Presidential Election Tribunal Judgment, is going to come out? I heard it's well, that's August, another. but I'm not sure of the date. Do you know? Well, um, that's, that's the transparency which we talk about. Look, whether you like it or not, there's no way whoever is elected as president or governor that is in court will have the full concentration to concentrate on, on administration because it will still be at the back of your mind. No matter how sure you think or no matter how clean you think your victory is, it will still be at the back of your mind. That you have a court case, you have a pending court case, you have a pending, and that itself affects governance. That's why we argue that this matter should have been dispensed with before swearing. In. Nobody knows, even the court is not even coming out with the dates with respect to when they are going to make announcement. And you see that Nigerians, both in diaspora and at home, uh, uh, there's a there's 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 an hashtag all eyes on the judiciary. You saw mm -hmm. the bots bringing out left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. And the judiciary is exerting too much pressure on itself. Whereas the judiciary should detach itself from politics and just dispense, come up with your argument, declare the winner the winner. If it's the president, in your opinion, that won the election and the election should continue with his administration, you make your pronouncement. And if you have a contract, you make your pronouncement and then we can move on. A lot of Nigerians are, are anxiously waiting. All you anxiously. need to do is, and it's anxiously. polarizing. And, and, and it's polarizing this country. All you need to do is just to go to go online, use all the social media handles, and you see how people are fighting one another, insulting one another, trolling one another, bringing ethnic, religious, and whatever identity you can think of. We have created different types of pillars of identification in the society, and it's not good for it's not good for it's not good for our country. Ojide Johnson, thank you so much for your time. Always a delight to hear you analyze issues on Of The Press. It's a pleasure to be with you. Have a wonderful Friday. You too. Enjoy the rest of your day. Ojide Johnson, Chief Lecturer at Nigerian Institute of Journalism, Lagos State, has been my guest on Of The Press. We'll take a break and come back with our first hot topic. Stay with us. <laughs>